Welcome to Twin City Community Church. Um, this is another Thirsty Thursday night. We are here in the bright lights. The big city. No. <laughs> the lights are bright. I can barely see. Anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, once again, uh, we're trying to get started on time this evening. Last time we got started 15 minutes late. So we just want to welcome everybody who's joining us on Facebook, live on Facebook. Um, this is our Thirsty Thursday night Bible study in Twin City Community Church. Um, let's go ahead and open up in prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you this evening for your many mercies each and every day. Lord God, we, we pray that you would continue to just reach down, Lord, from your throne and extend your mercy and grace as you do each and every day, Lord God. Our minds seem to forget just how good you've been to us and, and how much, Lord God, you desire that we would live lives that are pleasing to you. So, Father, we come together this evening in your word to learn your word, to know your word, that we may be able to live your word. Let it become real and manifest all that we hear. Let it be manifested in and through our lives, Lord God, that we would glorify you. I pray that those that are watching this evening would be blessed. I pray that those who watch in the future would be blessed as well. We thank you once again, Lord God, for everything you've done, you're doing, and going to continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we are this evening um, for our Thursday, Thursday night Bible study. Uh, let's just go ahead and get into God's Word real quick. Um, there, there have been a lot of questions from our last study. So I went ahead and made some uh, adjustments for the answers to the questions. We are... Uh, I'm going to be studying once, once again, um, showing, because we came out of the book of Jude, we're going to be showing some of the uh, teachings that aren't um, accurate. And so if you'll just uh, bear with me this evening and we'll follow the notes and see where the Lord leads us. In John chapter 5, if you'll turn in your Bibles there to John chapter 5, I want to read verse uh, 24. And uh, beginning at, at verse 24 of John chapter 5, just this one time when you get there, just say amen so I know you're there. Amen. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, it says, but has passed out of death into life. You hear what Jesus says? He who believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Romans chapter 10, um, verse 9 and 10. In Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 9, God's word says that if you confess, this is what the Apostle Paul is telling the Romans, Gentiles, all who did not know God before, because only Israel knew God, the God of the Bible, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's telling the Romans now. He says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Did it say you might? Did it say it's possible? It says you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulted in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. So what is salvation is a result of believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. Is, and what's the result of that? Salvation, right? Didn't say anything else. Didn't say light candles, crawl on your knees, baptize the water. Didn't say anything. All it said was what we read. Okay. And we were studying the book of Jude for almost three months. And in studying the book of Jude, what we came across was that Jude focuses mainly on false teaching, false teachers. He tells all those who are called to teach to be overseers, not only of your of the flock that you are uh, that you are in in, I guess, entrusted with and those that are around you. It says to. Always contend for the faith to be sure that when something is taught or told or mentioned in a, in a sense that they say it's true biblically, but you find that it's not, that we are to correct that or call it out and say, no, that's not what the word of God says. We're, we're, we're to do that on a continual basis. 
It doesn't say that we argue about it. It just says, hey, listen, just tell them and say, listen, all right, well, fine. If you're not going to listen to that, then I know that you are a false teacher. Okay. That's what we've been doing. And so after the book of Jude, we started about six weeks ago and we started talking about a specific church group, the Pentecostals, right? That's what we're talking about. This is our last week focusing on certain questions and next week will be the final one where we talk about being born again. Okay. So in Jude chapter one, if you'll turn there with me in Jude chapter one, beginning at verse one through four. And a lot of these passages, many people who watch continuously should have it memorized because we read out of this passage. It's going on four months now in Jude chapter one verse, which Jude only has one chapter beginning at verse one. It says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. By denying our only master and Lord Jesus Christ, what it means is Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. If anyone teaches anything contrary to the original teachings of the prophets and their disciples and of Jesus' teachings, that they are denying Jesus Christ by denying his truth. They're putting their interpretation of their idea out there. You understand? So they're denying him, his place as truth. Jesus was asked, what is truth? So everything that we find in the scriptures is truth. Anything contrary to that makes that person who teaches an untruth makes them ungodly. You don't have to, you know, murder someone or commit adultery to be ungodly. You can be ungodly by teaching something that isn't true. Does that make sense? All right. It's misrepresentation of God. First Corinthians chapter four, verse five. First Corinthians chapter four, beginning at verse five, it says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. The reason I read that was because we talked about it a couple of weeks ago that we're not judging these denominations that teach false teachings. We are correcting them. There's a difference between correcting and judging. The translation of the word judge in Greek is correct. It's to correct. When Jesus says before you can correct or judge your brother or anyone, anyone you come into contact with, before you can do that, you must first take the speck out of your eye. Then you'll be able to see clearly to correct someone else. You got it? If, if I'm doing, if I'm like, bro, you shouldn't be smoking marijuana, bro. You don't tell me it's not good for you, man, but I'm smoking marijuana. Am I a good example? I got to take the speck out of my eye first, right? I got I to gotta stop smoking marijuana and say, listen, you guys, you can't be smoking marijuana. It's bad for your body. You know what I mean? Take the speck out of your eye first. But we're not judging them. Here it says there's coming a time when Jesus is going to judge, right? But he's going to judge determined. He's going to be determining salvation and not salvation, okay? Those who are saved and those who are not. So that's a final judgment. Here, we're to, we're to, like a judge in court, we're to make decisions on what is and what isn't true. You got it? All right. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, that's what it says. And you can look at that and we'll, we'll read that together. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. We'll begin at 16. And it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Okay? If you're not teaching the truth of God's word, you're inadequate. Okay? And you're not able to do good work for God. Okay? If you're teaching false teachings, you're not doing a good work. It's ungodly. That's what the word of God said. It's ungodly. But notice there it says it's for teaching, 
for reproof and for correction. Okay? That word correction there is the same, same word Jesus uses in the book of Matthew chapter 6 and 7. It's the word judge. Doesn't mean to judge for all eternity. It means to make a judgment call, a correction on the person. That's contending for the faith. To correct somebody when they're wrong is contending for the faith. Not like when you're correcting somebody so that way they live a, a, more, a better Christian life. We're talking about correcting false teaching. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. Now, so... This is why it leads us to this title. Exposing, this is part six now, exposing the false teachings and heresy of the Pentecostal churches. Okay, we're not going to call out a single church anymore. We're going to say churches. That makes sense? All right. Not church. No, not churches chicken. We're talking about churches, iglesias. Okay. He's talking about why is he mad at churches chicken? Is he going to say he only likes Popeye's voice? No. Exposing the false teachings and heresy of the Pentecostal churches. Okay. Speaking of churches, this is a hot church. Anyway, here's what we've been looking at. We've been looking at a couple of markers. Now, we may not be able to play these videos, okay, for, for certain reasons. May not be able to. But if we can, we're just going to listen to them. Um, I'm going to pause them on occasion, and we're going to get to where we're going, okay? And this will be the last time we see this many videos. Next time, we're only going to see one, okay? So let's see if it works for us. We'll find out. Okay? The word of the Lord. I want to talk to you tonight from the book of Mark, chapter 16, and we'll begin reading at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Those are strong, sobering words. Basically, what Jesus is saying there, and I'm going to show this to you even more, is that if we believe and we're baptized, we'll be saved. If we believe and we're baptized, we'll be saved. And so, hence our title tonight, He That Believes and, everybody say and, is baptized, shall be be saved. Baptism is a very important part. Now, you, you got that? What did he say? We picked this apart a couple of weeks ago, right? He, this is the Pentecostal belief. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. For the last five weeks, we've been showing different parts on how that is not true. Okay? And I know they use certain verses. We talked about it, but they used certain verses out of context. You must know some Greek when you're reading a contextual scripture in order to know what it's actually saying. When it says you must believe and be baptized, is it saying that the thing that follows, okay, what follows and does that mean that 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 is included in the first word that's used? Believe and like it's necessary for the next one. And you must be able to understand that. And when we looked at it, we saw that right after that part where it says he must believe, right? And he read it and be baptized will be saved. But then it was a comma and it said, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It didn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. All he was focused on, on what will damn you, is that you don't believe. Not that you don't believe and are not baptized. You understand? And he didn't say that he who doesn't believe but is baptized still isn't saved. No, it just said he who does not believe is damned. All right? Let's look at the next marker right here. Let's check it out. I think this is going to be, he's going to say it again. For, there's a reason for it. What need to do Listen. to be saved? What must you do to be saved? The Bible says in Acts 2.38... And this is not my this is not my formula. This is Peter's. I'm just giving you what the Bible says. And whatever your beliefs are tonight, they must be biblical. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here we are. Remember, Jesus said, Go preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or lost. You're out of luck. You must be 
You must repent. You must be baptized. Peter said, repent. Be baptized. Every one of you. Not just some of you. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He said in verse 39, for the promises to you, your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying to them, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now after the Apostle Peter preached his message in verse 41, the Bible says, When they, when they, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Everybody that heard that message that gladly received it, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. When you hear a preacher preach, when you hear what I'm saying tonight, if you will gladly receive what I'm saying, you will want to be baptized. They that gladly received his word were baptized. Not everybody gladly received it. Some rejected it. Some put it off to another day. And so the Bible says that there were 3,000 souls added to the church when they were baptized. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Folks, you must be born again to go to heaven. You must be baptized. Born again, meaning you Listen. must repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, there's other things that a person... Now, you see that? Once again, you're seeing it where he says that in order to be saved... He, he says two things. He says, in order to be saved, you must repent and be baptized with water. Once again, he's saying it, right? The second thing he just said, he said that salvation equals being born again. But he says that being born again is believing, repenting, being baptized in water, and receiving the Holy Ghost. He said that's the formula. Did you hear what he said in the beginning? This is Peter's formula. He said, so if there's anything, if you're going to believe anything, you must be biblical is what he says. Well, we're going to be biblical. We're going to be very biblical because he said specifically, and this is what they teach, that this is the formula. Acts 2.38 is the formula that you must repent, be baptized with water, then you'll receive the Holy Ghost. You don't receive the Holy Ghost unless you repent and are baptized with water. Once you get baptized with water, they say, then you'll receive the Holy Ghost. We're going to see that later on that that's not true. All right. Next marker. 23 um, to 24.15. Let's see. Now, you'll notice here as we go through the Word of God, everybody is saved the same way. It's not, well, this person said, well, I just repented. And this person over here said, well, I just spoke in tongues. And this person over here just says, well, I just believed in the Lord. No. If you will read it for yourself, you will see that they all... They were saved the same way by being born again of the water, being baptized, and being filled with the Holy Ghost, being born of the Spirit. Amen. Okay, and then we see Paul in Acts 22 and 16. He's recounting the story. He says, and now, he said, Ananias came in in Acts 22 and 16. And he said, hey, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling upon the name of the Lord. Folks, when you are baptized in Jesus' Listen. name, all of your sins are being washed away. Ananias said, hey, why are you waiting? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Folks, when you get baptized in Jesus' So you stop right there. Did you see what he said? He said that when Paul was talking about his experience, when he was called to Jesus Christ, he, Jesus told him to go to Ananias. Ananias would baptize him, right? And when he said that Ananias would baptize him, he said that Ananias would baptize him in the name of the Lord. But here's what he said. What he said there was that when Paul was baptized, that that water baptism washed away, cleansed his sins. We know that the Bible doesn't teach that water baptism washes away your sins. We know that. Those who are Christians, right? Who have studied God's word. But if you're a young Christian, you're going to think that, wow, he's on to something. But here's 
If, if you know English, and this is why it's important to go to school, it's important because if you don't go to school to learn certain things, you could go to hell because you'll be reading the word of God wrong. Do you need someone who can read it to you right? Because he even said that your sins will be washed away, not because of the baptism, calling upon the name of the Lord. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you believe. Remember, we read it in Romans. You believe, right, with your heart, then you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Because calling on the name of the Lord washes away your old man. Because you believe, you receive salvation. It's not the water. We're going to see that again in a minute. But you got to pay close attention to when they're teaching because it's going to sound like, man, these guys are so right. You know? Oh, my goodness. They sound so clear. And as I told you before, if you've ever listened to a teaching from a Jehovah Witness teacher, man, they're so eloquent and so convincing and captivating. Man, they'll make you become a believer. You'll be like, wow, these guys are interesting until you start listening to every word that comes out of their mouth. Okay? Now, this is the last, that last one, and we'll move on. Acts chapter 10, verse 46, Cornelius, he was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. And Peter receives a vision. Go with these men. Peter goes. He goes to Cornelius' house to make a long story short. Peter is speaking to them, and while he is speaking to them, they all receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 10, um, verses 44, 45, 46. They all get the Holy Ghost. Verse 46 says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's how they knew they got the Holy Ghost. So here they are. Cornelius is a believer. He's got the Holy Ghost in his life now. He didn't say, Thanks, Peter. That's all I need. I've spoken other tongues. I've seen angels. I'm super spiritual. He didn't do that. He was teachable. Look what, look what happened after they got the Holy Ghost. Verse 47, Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. He didn't say, Hey, you've seen an angel. You're good. He didn't say, Hey, you've got the Holy Ghost. That's all you need to do. Remember wow. what Jesus said. You must be wow. born again of the water and the Spirit. Baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. To That's the gospel. That is the gospel. And so uh, they were baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of their sins. Wow. All of a sudden, Cornelius, the believer, has been born again of the water and the Spirit. Then let me take you to... Now... You notice what he said there. He contradicted himself. I pointed this out last week. Remember he said that in Acts 2.38, it was, it was a formula. The formula was this, that you repent, be baptized with water, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. He shouldn't have read this, ex this experience of Cornelius because in Cornelius, all they did was hear Peter, and because they believed what they heard, they received the Holy Spirit, all right? And immediately that means they were what? Saved. Then it says, after Peter stopped preaching, they were already saved. He goes, so now that they've received the Holy Spirit, what prevents them from being water baptized? He should have never read that passage. But if you're not paying attention to every word that comes out of their mouth, then you'll think, man, he's making so much sense here. But he just called it a formula. This is exactly the order it's got to go. And if you don't get baptized in water, you will not. What did he say? You're out of luck, right? So what does he say about someone who's believed but's never been baptized? Go ask them. They'll say, if you've never been baptized in water and you die, well, you're out of luck. You go to hell. Really? Really? Okay. So he contradicts himself there, which is interesting. We're going to see many other places where they do the same thing. But notice that he's emphasizing the thing of water being water baptized. And in the last couple of weeks, we've already talked about what that water was. When Jesus said that you must be born again of water and the spirit, we learned what the water was. The water is a water baptism. Jesus said that the water is the Holy Spirit because Jesus says that he who believed in him, they would receive what? The Holy Spirit, who is the fountain of living water. The Holy Spirit is known in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as the fountain of living water. And because God is a spirit, only God the Father, 
who is the spirit could give you the water that's living. He's the only one who could give that to you. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. You had nothing to do with the, your parents, what they did in order for you to be born. Likewise, you got nothing to do with being born again. All you can do is believe. You don't got to do nothing but believe. And if you believe, your only father who's spiritual can cause you to be a new creation, could cause you to be born anew. How does he do that? He puts in you what only he can put in you, and that's the living water that is the Holy Spirit. We'll keep going and learning more about that next week because we're going to do the study on being born again next week. But I've already covered this. But just for those who are new listening, go listen to last week's and you'll be able to get caught up with where we are right now. Now, I need for you to, to see this 32nd piece because this is in closing on his part. Okay. Why wait? Why carry us thou? So don't wait. And arise, be baptized, calling upon the name of the Lord. Wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Folks, it's time to do it. It's time to do it right. It's time. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So if you're not baptized, according to what Benjamin Davis, the pastor of the Rosenberg Pentecostal Church, what Benjamin Davis says is that um, it, his teaching is not really about water baptism. It's about salvation. He says that um, if you're not baptized with water, then you're not saved. And remember what we talked about last week, that it's about being justified with God. Justification. What makes me right with God? So justification is God's righteous act of removing the guilt and penalty of sin, while at the same time declaring the ungodly to be righteous. Through how? Through faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice. So Jesus dying for me makes me right with God. Nothing else that I do. All I got to do is believe. Amen? That's all I got to do. Okay? For those who still are curious, let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 21 through 27. Picking up on some of our old notes from last week. At verse 21, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For everyone has sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation or a payment, okay? A ransom payment in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Therefore, verse 27, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. Now, let me read verse 28 for you, just to throw it in there. For we maintain that a man is justified, how? By faith apart from works. When you get baptized in water, that's a work. That means something. You, Me as a human, I got to do something more. Jesus, you know what bugged me? It was so disrespectful how when he said that Paul, when Paul received the Holy Spirit or when Ananias and uh, when uh, the others received the Holy Spirit, what did he say? That, that wasn't enough. They needed to be baptized in water too. How disrespectful. You know what I mean? Like if something spiritual, if I can do something in the natural to equal what God has done in the spirit. Oh, my goodness, man. That's so disrespectful to me. I don't know if you guys caught that or not, but that was disrespectful. He's, and he was even said, he didn't say, you know, hey, I already got the Holy Ghost or, hey, I saw an angel. That's good enough, isn't it? He said, no, he was teachable. He needed to know more because he had only did, remember what we taught week one and two? He only did step one and two. He now needs step three in order to complete the process. You know what I mean? No, there's only one step. And that's believing. That is it. The other things are up to God. He makes us born again. He sends the Holy Ghost. He decides who is saved and who's not. Just because I believe that Jesus is Lord doesn't mean I'm really believing it with all my heart. That's why many are going to say, Lord, Lord. Did we not? Did we not? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Did, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we go to church all the time? Didn't we do this? I never knew you. Didn't we follow the formula? Didn't we follow the formula? We did. We did. I... I thought I thought I put a cap. 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It sure is quiet in here. Galatians 2, verse 16. Here's what that verse says. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by, their, by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh or no man will be justified. You got that? That's plain and simple. Plain and simple. So, faith apart from works, justifies the sinner based on the blood of Jesus Christ. You got that? We're saved based on the blood that Jesus shed, not based on the water that is given or performed the ceremony of water baptism. So the question is, does the Bible teach that water baptism is necessary in order for us to be justified and made righteous? Let's say I was on the earth and the only book I found while I was walking around is the book of Romans. Nowhere in the book of Romans does it say I must be baptized with water. So guess what? I probably would never figure out the true way of being, you know, born again or have a right relationship with God, right? Whose fault would that be? Oh God, you let me find one book? And not all the books that are telling me I need to be baptized with water. Oh, guess what? I believed everything I read in this book of Romans. Is that not good enough? Yeah, it would have been because I would have found in Romans chapter 10 where it says that what? If I believe in my heart that Jesus was Lord and he died and God raised him from the grave. And if I confessed it with my mouth, I shall be saved, right? If I was on an island, that's the only book I found. That's all I would need. Every book in the Bible, if that was the only book you found, is sufficient enough to, for you to find how God wants you to come near to him, to draw closer to him. You got that? Every one single book, you'll find salvation in it. Amen? So, Benjamin Davis teaches, apart from water baptism, one sins are not forgiven. No salvation otherwise. Benjamin Davis teaches that water baptism, listen to this, washes away our sins. Hmm? Really? Question number one we'll deal with tonight. Are we saved, justified before water baptism, after water baptism, or at the moment during water baptism? When are we right with God? Are we right with God? Right when, you know, as soon as I confess and they say, all right, come get in line. You're about to get baptized. So as soon as the man touches me, am I, am I saved then? Or after I'm in the water, am I saved then? Or when I come up out of the water, am I saved? Question number one. Before, after, right? During the moment or during? Now, question number two. Does water baptism wash away our sins? Okay. Now, here's question number three that we're going to try to tackle next week to put an end to um, focusing on that teaching of the water. We'll get into how they say um, that you can lose your salvation and everything else. OK, they deny the power of God to keep you. And I'll show you everywhere. It says God will keep you. Jesus says all those that are mine, no one take away. I'll show you that as well. We'll talk about salvation later. So question number two, does water baptism wash away our sins? Question number three, does Jesus mean that we must be baptized with water to be born again in John chapter three, verse one through 10? I'm throwing that out there because for those of you who want to get a head start to go and do your research, to be ready for next week, that's the passage we're going to touch on next week. Okay. John chapter three, verse one through 10. Where Jesus says, in order to enter into the kingdom, you must be born again. He called being baptized with water, being born again. He, when Jesus said, you must be born of water and spirit, that's what he calls it. So he says, when it says of water and spirit, he calls the water, the water of baptism. The spirit, he calls the Holy Ghost. But he, he's forgetting that God, the Father, is the spirit. And the Holy Spirit is called water in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, we'll touch on it again, but I'm just so anxious. Jesus told Nicodemus, you're the teacher of all of Israel. All they had was the Old Testament, not the New. Jesus says, you should know what I'm talking about. You should know what water means. You needed to be cleansed by the water of God. God said he would do that in Ezekiel 36. Those of you who want to jumpstart. Okay. All right. So let's look. Let's answer this question real quick. Question. Um, 
Number two, does water baptism wash away our sins? And number one, are we saved just right before water baptism, after water baptism, or at the moment during water baptism? But mainly, I like this question right here. Does the Bible teach that water baptism is necessary in order for us to be justified and made right with God? Or another word is justified and righteous is saved. Okay, keep that in mind. All right, so let's move on with this. Luke chapter 23. In Luke 23... Beginning at verse 39. Verse 39 through 43. Here's what we see. It says, One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other, the other criminal answered and rebuking the other one said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Was that was that thief water baptized? No, he was not. So this tells us that baptism is not absolutely necessary. Look at Colossians chapter two, verse eight. In Colossians chapter 2, it's talking about things you do with your hands and things you do without your hands. Beginning at verse 8 through 14, we got so much to cover tonight. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. This is what's happening with false religious groups. Okay. It says, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Right? In the Old Testament, we talked about it, that the men used to get circumcised, right? With hands, with the knife. Now, when Jesus died for us when we believe in him he doesn't circumcise us physically anymore what does he circumcise our heart got that he changes our heart he cuts away the old me and gives me the new me all right with his spirit circumcision without hands likewise let's keep reading therefore in verse 12 having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the circumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, which is propitiation, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So it said that when Jesus died and was buried, that is the baptism that he's talking about. He's not talking about water baptism. He said when Jesus died, we were baptized with him in death. Because baptism doesn't only mean when you're submerged in water, it means to be submerged into. When I taught it week one, I said that everyone in Israel, when God told them to believe Moses, it says in the book of Exodus that all the people that believed Moses to leave Egypt were baptized into Moses. Does that mean that God took the people and put them inside of Moses, took them out? No, your mind. Have you ever said, you know, or thought before that, man, I'm, I'm just submerged in my work or I'm submerged in all my duties. There's a heavy burden that I'm in. I'm so deep in this thing. You know what I mean? And all the people needed to believe Moses in order to do what Moses told them to do. If they didn't put the blood over their doorposts, they were going to die. But those that were baptized into Moses believing, they were in everything he was saying. They were all in. They were baptized into Moses. Okay. We taught that in week one. You can go back six lessons and you'll see it. Okay. Now, so therefore, Colossians 2 verse 8 through 14 taught that there's a baptism without hands. What is that? When Jesus died and he was buried, it's like we died with him on the cross. Every person in the past, present, at Jesus' time, and in the future was nailed to the cross with Jesus. Every person in the past, present, and future was buried with Jesus. Every person in the past, present, and future was raised to life with Jesus. Amen? That is without hands. 
So, we are united through faith, not by water. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Whew. Beginning at verse 9, here's what we say. It says, and may, it says, And we may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith, in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of what? Faith. That means I'm made right with God if I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And I believe that he did what he did in order for me to be right with God. So I'm made righteous. I'm made right. How? By being baptized in water? No, by faith. By faith in who Jesus is and what he did. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Here's what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. How was I saved? By grace. God just gifted it to me. All I had to do was what? By faith, believe him. That's it. Verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one will boast. You got it? None of us were saved by anything we did other than believe by faith. And you know what's interesting? Even the faith, we're gonna, we'll, we'll learn this next time, even the faith that we have to believe in Jesus, to believe in God, is a gift from God. You, no one, the Bible teaches that no one has faith to believe in God. Even that God must give it to us in order to believe in him. Faith is what God gives us in order to see what it is he wants us to see, in order to hear what he wants us to hear, in order to know what he wants us to know. Now remember, the Holy Spirit is given to us, okay? And I always tell people, I think the Holy Spirit is given to us when God knows that we are getting it. Because in order for us, the Bible says, even to say, Lord, we must have the Holy Spirit. So I believe once we start fathoming in our mind and thinking, he's telling the truth. We, we receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit helps me to say, oh, Jesus, you are Jesus. I believe in you. You know what I mean? No water. I don't need no water. First John chapter three, verse three. Mm-hmm. It is that boom, just immediately. First John three, three. Here's what it says. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever has their hope fixed on who Jesus is and what he did and what it means that he paid the price for me, that purifies us. What purifies us? My faith believing in him makes me clean and right with God. Got that? Who's pure? Jesus is pure. Who's perfect? Jesus is perfect. None of us are actually perfect, but because we are in him, just like Noah was saved from the destruction of the judgment of God. What was God's judgment? The water. What did Noah have to get into? The ark. The Bible teaches in 1 Peter that Jesus is the New Testament ark. When we are in him, all the judgment of God and the wrath of God it goes around us and it's all in the world and it's going to be on judgment day and before the great white throne. But we escape it because Jesus is the ark that we are in. So whenever you see in the Bible where it says you are in Christ or in him or in the son, it's making the comparison that Jesus is the modern day New Testament ark. Amen. You got that? Okay. Romans chapter 2, verse 26. Romans chapter 2, verse 26. Beginning at verse 26, here's what it says. Woo. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Okay? So what is this saying? What makes me right with God is that I believed in the Son, but the evidence that I am right with God is that I do what he's telling me to do. It says here that if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, obeys God, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Meaning there are people that are lost and don't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They don't love God's word, right? So even though I'm not circumcised physically, my actions and obedience to God and his word 
look as if I am circumcised. But we have already learned that the circumcision of the New Testament believer is the circumcision of the heart, not of the physical body. Okay. So even though I'm not circumcised physically, I am seen by God as being circumcised spiritually. Even though I didn't get nailed on a cross or pay for my own sins or get buried. And even though I didn't come back to life and wasn't raised on the third day, because I'm in Christ, he sees me as if I was nailed, as if I was buried and as I did raise again. Okay. Romans chapter four, verse nine through 17. <sighs> Romans chapter 4, <coughs> verse 9 through 17. No, the, isn't that the same thing? Ain't this there why Paul, but uh, <clears throat> Peter, because he was still circumcised? Yes, and yeah, and in the book of Galatians, it teaches that Paul had to rebuke Peter because Peter was still wanting New Testament people, Gentiles, to do what the Jews were doing in the physical. Okay? That's true. And there's also a place in the book of Acts, we'll see later on, we study the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul was still making vows. There was up until, I think, chapter 14, he had long hair. He didn't have to make a vow with God. He was already right with God. But he was still so addicted to doing the Old Testament stuff. You know what I mean? We'll see them growing too, which is what God, why he's so merciful to us. So in verse 9, it says, Is this blessing then the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then... Was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Look at what this is saying. When was Abraham made right with God? God told him, I want you to listen to me and follow me. But when you do, I want you to go and get circumcised and circumcise every male person that's with you. But when was he right with God? He was right with God when he believed God. Then he got circumcised afterwards. It's likewise. We are right with God, saved by God, and we are justified through Jesus Christ when we believe. Then we go and get baptized in water by being obedient to God because he said to. Not because I have to. If I, if I really love God because the disciples teach that we should be baptized and say that we need to be baptized in order to be saved, we just need to be baptized because it is what we do to fulfill all the commands that God gives us. That's one of them, okay? It's like God says to love your neighbor. Listen, if you don't love your neighbor, you're not going to go to hell. But man, if you don't love your neighbor, it's a sign that maybe you're on your way because you really don't have the Holy Ghost. You got that? That makes sense? So your action proves the, the process, what God did. Did God do it or not? Now, I'm going to move on. Um, God will regard or see a believer as circumcised if he keeps the word of God. Okay? He will see you as being right with him if you keep the word of God. The evidence that you're right with him is that you are attempting to live the life that God has called you to live. John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14, verse 15. And here's what it says in beginning at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You got that? So what he's saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. You will. He didn't say you might. He says you will. Why will you? Not because you can do it in your own strength, but because he's given you the strength. Right? Yeah. He's given you the Holy Spirit to help you. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. In Acts chapter 22, this is a passage he read. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Let me see if I can find my way there. Beginning at verse 16, look what he says. He says, now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, pay attention to that verse. Now, get up. Be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Would it be right for you to get up and be baptized before you call on the name of the Lord? No, because the only reason you're going to get baptized is because you've already chosen to call on the name of the Lord. So you don't get up. This is a matter of grammar. This is a matter of knowing what comes first, the horse or the cart, right? This is a matter of 
Did you go and get baptized before you heard anything? And then you said, now tell me so I can call on the name of the Lord. No, you call on the name of the Lord. Then you did what? Then you were baptized. This is a matter of grammar, y'all. It's let me read it again. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. OK, say you didn't hear the gospel. You just get up and get baptized, wash away your sins. No, and then it says calling on the name of the Lord. So while you're calling on the name of the Lord, get in line because we're about to baptize you. You got what I'm saying? There's an order there. You got to see that order. Listen, therefore, upon calling on his name, God hears us and forgives us. Then in obedience, we should be water baptized. You got that? There's no way you're going to get water baptized if you don't even call on the name of the Lord. Because calling on the name of the Lord means you're confessing because you believe in your heart. So you don't get baptized in water before you confess and believe in your heart. You call on the name of the Lord first. And when you call on the name of the Lord, then now you want to be obedient to whatever he's asking you to do. But you've already called on the name of the Lord because you know what? He needs you to do what? To repent. To call out to him that you need him. Without him, you can do what? Nothing. So Benjamin Davis teaches that you must be baptized. And here's the other thing. I'll throw this in there as extra. You must be baptized only in their church group. Only in the Pente if you got baptized outside of Pentecostal church, you're going, you're still on your way to hell. That's not a true baptism. Okay. Then it says um, that you must be baptized only in their church group. Number two, um, it says it, in their movement or by someone in authority in their denomination. You got that? So if you got baptized any other church where you're at, when you believe with all your heart, they don't care if you believe with all your heart. You didn't get water baptized by them. They got a special power and anointing that you need for them to touch you and dunk you. You got that? That's what they teach. That's kind of, that's, that's almost like a cult. Jehovah Witnesses say, if you don't go to their church, you're lost. You know, all we who believe the word of God know is that if anyone, no matter what church you go to, if anyone believes and confesses, then they are saved. Doesn't matter where you are, right? The Mormons say, if you don't get baptized by them, you're on your way to hell. The Catholics say, if you're not a Catholic, they're not going to marry you, and you're on your way to hell. Okay? Those are, those are strict rules that aren't in the Bible, and it, it leads people to, to follow these kind of cult-like teachings. So, Benjamin Davis says that another baptism is seen as false. There is the only true church. Theirs is the only true church, group, and way to salvation. Okay? Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 41. Let's look at it, and then we're going to focus on it. Acts chapter 2, 37 to 41. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Pay close attention. Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So what did they do first? They received his word. They believed the gospel. If you don't believe it, you're not going to want to do the next thing he tells you to do, right? But they believed it. And because they believed it, their heart were willing, because of the Holy Spirit that had already been given to them, to do the next thing. What was that? To be what? Baptized. But let's look at it closer. Benjamin Davis says that Acts 2.38 is a formula for being right with God. Remember he said that? It's a formula. But we read in where? We read in Romans. We read in Philippians. We read in Ephesians. We read in the book of John. Everywhere we read it, it says that if you believe and confess right with your mouth that you will be what? Saved. To me, that's a better formula. That sounds more straight if there is. But there is no formula. Right? All God says is to what? Believe in what? Confess. Uh, uh, you know, uh, since, since, since all the books are written like years afterwards, those aren't the clarifications. 
they of clarify it. they clarify it. of what happened on yep. the day of Pentecost. They clarify it. They make it clear. They interpret it, basically. Remember what we said? Remember the word we used about five months ago? Analogous? The Bible teaches the Bible. The Bible interprets the Bible. If you read the Bible accurately, you'll know, okay, I, I know what he said. He's excited, fired up. I know what he said, but that's not a formula order. You know what? Or else Jesus is wrong in some places and Peter is right. Or else Paul is right and Peter is wrong. You got it? You got to understand the complete gospel in order to know, is there an order to it or is it this way, you know? And he said earlier in the video, he said that everyone doesn't get saved differently. Everyone must do it in this order, Acts 2.38. He says it's the formula. But look at this. There's a great difference between the real intended meaning of a verse and its implied meaning. We're going to see an example of what I'm saying. Implied understanding is based upon the first reading of a Bible passage or scripture. Remember when you first read the Bible, you thought it meant this, and then you went to church like, oh, that's what it means, right? You were, you were what? Implying. You were making an implication of what you thought it meant, all right? Now, the correct interpretation can be gained only through a serious study of the verse itself, its context, its relationship to the clear teaching of scripture found everywhere else in the Bible. You can't just take that one thing and say, oh, this is it. This is it. That's what they do. They don't compare it to other scriptures anywhere. They stay right there in the book of Acts. Okay? Now, let's look at this. If his rule is right, that Peter's mention of believing, repenting, being baptized in water, then receiving the Holy Ghost is correct, which he already made himself, you know, uh, he contradicted himself when he read the book of Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46. When it said that they believed after they heard Peter, then they went to go get water baptized. But look, if we can make formulas out of God's word, look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And tell me if, if this is the way to be saved. Okay? Verse 18 through 24. Let's read it. Check it out. A ruler questioned Jesus saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? To be saved, right? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Verse 23. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Look at that. So what's the formula here? In order to be saved, in order to inherit the kingdom, in order to have eternal life, I got to do what? Honor my mother, honor my father. I got to love the Lord my God with all my heart. And then what? I must not commit adultery. And then what's the final thing? I got to go sell everything I have and give it to the poor. Then I will be saved. Is that the formula? He's talking to this one guy because this one guy has a problem with money. Yes, Jesus was cool with them and said, you do all those other things. But even doing all those other things, my, the point Jesus is making is that if you do everything you can in the flesh as a human, even if you make one little mistake by not giving to the poor and sharing, you're wrong. So if you did 99 things, and one, the 100 thing you didn't do, you're wrong. That's why Jesus says, but you must come follow me. Believe me, because there's nothing you're ever going to do in your flesh to be right with me. So is that a formula? Because if it is, go sell everything you got. Then follow Jesus and you'll be right with him. Got it? That's coming straight out of Jesus' mouth. He didn't say go and get baptized, did he? And then come and follow me. No, he didn't say that. He didn't even say confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. But when you're a studier, when you're a student of God's word, you know that's what he means. But we don't know that. Hindsight tells us when we study and we grow in God. Oh, that's what he means. Come and follow him. To follow him really, to truly follow him means to, to believe him. And everything that comes out of his mouth, I accept it as it's what I need to do in order to be right with him. I need to believe that he is who he says he is, right? Got it? Now, according to this Bible passage, what must the rich young ruler do to inherit eternal life? Sell all that he had and then follow Jesus. But he had to give everything that he, everything he sold, the money, he's got to give it to who? The poor, right? Does, is that what we all must do? No. That's only what Jesus told him to do. Jesus knew his heart. Okay? So, 
Look at this phrase. This is what I meant by understanding a passage and really paying attention to it. Look at this sentence. Wanted for terrorism and murder, Osama bin Laden, $1 million reward. So if you don't look at that sentence accurately and read it accurately, you're thinking they're wanting to reward him for terrorism and murder. We're looking for Osama bin Laden to give him a million dollars because of his terrorism and murder. We want to reward him. But if you think it through and read it accurately, you, that last phrase starts first. One million dollar reward. Wanted for terrorism and murder, Osama bin Laden. You got it? But when you read it the first time, you're thinking, wow, they want to give him a million dollars for being a terrorist. Amazing. You got that? Reading in context is real important. So in Acts 2.38, let's look at it again. We're almost done. Acts 2.38. How many of y'all watching live are enjoying it? Say amen. Everybody say amen. <laughs> amen. Acts 2.38. Acts 2, look what he says. He says... Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, each of you, right? Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you notice there's a what? There's a, what is, what is there after the word sins? There's a semicolon. The semicolon means to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You must repent. First, and then be baptized. You got it? So, if you repent, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And because you got the Holy Spirit, He'll help you to be obedient to do the water baptism. If you don't really believe in God and didn't repent and didn't receive the Holy Spirit, you're not going to want to be baptized. You're going to go like this. <clears throat> Forget that. I'm not doing that. You got it? Let me tell you how I know for sure. And this is going a little farther. Peter used the Greek word ice. Okay? which means because of, not in order to, okay? He says, repent and be baptized, each of you. And why? For the what? Forgiveness of your sins. He's not saying, in order to be forgiven, you must repent and be baptized. He's saying, because you've repented, you'll receive forgiveness of your sins. Now go and be baptized. That's the way it's written in the Greek. Now, look at this passage. Go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. This is where it gets difficult. Beginning at verse 41. Remember what I told y'all too about watching two-hour movies and then falling asleep during a one-hour Bible study. You better quit it. <laughs> and then y'all binging on a whole series. I got to watch four of them. Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh, Jesus is talking here. He says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. You see that phrase? They, they repented because of. That's the same word used there. That word ice. They repented because of. So no one repents unless they hear a sermon. It said that after Peter preached, he was, the people were pierced at the heart. They were repenting. And then he said, what must we do? All right? They were repenting because of the preaching not Jonah, of Jonah, not at, okay? Or not in order. Not in order. So in order to hear Jonah preach, they repented. No, that's not the way it goes. They repented because of the preaching of Jonah. They use it the wrong way in the Pentecostal movement. So likewise, he said that for the remission of your sins or the forgiveness of your sins. Likewise, the remission of sins in Acts chapter 238 happened before the practice of water baptism. No one's going to want to be baptized with water before you're made right with God. Who's going to want to do that? You understand what I'm saying? Only someone who's told to. Someone who loves, you know, what they heard, just like the guy we're going to see in a minute. So remission, of, remission means the cancellation of a debt, a charge, or a penalty. It means forgiveness. So when were you forgiven? Remember last week? You were forgiven at the moment you what? Confessed. 
Now, here's, here's the part. This is why they only read Acts 2, 38 through 41. They don't want to read to you Acts chapter, four, Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 21. Why? Because it totally debunks everything they say. Look at Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. Remember what they said? It was a formula that you must do what? That you must repent, be baptized with water, and then receive the Holy Spirit. But look what Peter, the same preacher, look what he says in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. This totally blows their myth up. But Peter, taking his stand with the other 11 disciples, raised his voice and declared to them that were listening, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days. Listen, what he's doing, he's quoting an Old Testament passage to make an interpretation of what he's about to say next. You got it? So he wouldn't quote something that contradicts what he means. He's quoting something that means exactly what he's going to say, except he didn't say it exactly the way he interpreted it based on what he's reading out of what? The book of the book of what? Joel. Come on, y'all. Everybody awake. Wake up, everybody. Um, uh, well, uh, I'm lost. No, stay with me. So look what he says in verse 17. It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out forth my spirit on all mankind. We want to know when, right? And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond servant, he says. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women. I will in those days pour forth my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. Listen, last verse. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You notice he didn't say there, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and is baptized with water will be saved. He didn't say that, did he? It's the same preacher, same chapter. You got what I'm saying? If he meant that there was a formula, then why did he screw it up by interpreting, using the book of Joel to mean what he's trying to say, to interpret what he's saying? He wouldn't have contradicted himself because this is what he means. You got it? Can everyone, let me read it one more time. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, remember we read in Acts 22, and calling on the name of the Lord, you will be forgiven, and then you'll be what? Baptized. You don't ever get baptized for calling on the name of the Lord. Look what it says here. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's say we only found the, this book of Acts, and the rest of that chapter was missing. And that's all you did. Would you be saved? Yes. yes, you would. Absolutely. Just because he says it a different way in the next coming verses doesn't exclude and cancel out what he just said right here. Here, the same preacher who says that in order for you to receive the Holy Spirit, you must what? Repent and be baptized. Then the Holy Spirit will come. But the way he said it in Greek is not the same. That's the only difference here. Because the, the book of Joel interprets him better because Joel is saying it in original Hebrew. So the translation in Greek, it puts words at the end. It's like in Spanish, you don't say the word in the beginning, you say it at the end. Te vas a ir, you know, or como esta todo? You know, you say things different in different order. That's the way it is in Greek. And so that second part where Peter's actually him talking, it puts it, puts it in the wrong order because it's in Greek. But when you read it in original Hebrew, it's in a right order. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Same preacher didn't say water. Got it? Everybody say and. Yeah. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall, will be saved. No water mentioned right there. Same preacher, six and a half verses later, he says the second thing. So Peter says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what he says. Notice that Peter does not say, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and is baptized will be saved. 
Or if that's what he meant, he would have said it. He would, or he would have found another verse and used another verse that said, And Joel said, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and is baptized will be saved. No, he used that verse because that verse interprets exactly what he's going to say. Got it? Y'all with me? In closing, if Peter meant that baptism was essential to salvation, then why did he quote from the book of Joel? It's confusing, isn't it? Unless you know the scriptures. The reference would be irrelevant. Why use a reference from another book somewhere if it's not going to interpret what I'm about to say next? Because just because he said it in a different order doesn't mean it's a formula. If you got any common sense at all, you know that before you are going to be baptized, you got to believe first. And because you know that the Bible teaches everywhere else that those who believe will receive the Holy Spirit, you can put two and two together. You're smart enough. You got enough rationalization. You don't need someone to come and trick you and tell you that Jesus is an angel when the Bible teaches that he's God in the flesh like the Jehovah Witnesses do. Hmm. Interesting. So now, let me just pass that. So when they called upon Christ, they repented. That act of faith. He who what? And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? So that act of faith brought salvation or remission or the cancellation of your debt that you owed to God. Jesus paid it. What brought it? You're calling out on the name of the Lord. Got it? Once again, remission means a cancellation of a debt, charge, or penalty. They were then, it says, that they were then individually baptized to show their new identification with Christ. Y'all good? Everyone all right? If I can get someone for uh, the cameras over here, that'd be great. All right? And so, um, uh, any questions? Before we take off, anybody got any questions? No? You want to call Eli? Any questions? Because the big one's got to be changed too. You probably don't see the big Yes, talk to me. Uh, a good example would have been, you know, uh, La Casa Blanca. Oh, La Casa Blanca, uh, the White House. Yeah. Yes. What, what you actually said was correct. Was correct, yeah. So, it would, well, see, I, I'm Spanglish, so I don't know that good. But, but the actual way of saying it would have been La Casa Blanca. But we say it in English, white house, instead of, instead of house that's white, right? Yep. That's the way Greek is. So when Peter spoke, he spoke in Greek, in Aramaic Greek. When Joel was speaking, he spoke in Hebrew, which was the accurate way. In Greek, it's backwards like Spanish, okay? That's what, but, and the reason that most Pentecostal pastors don't know that, because they don't go to seminary. They just learn amongst themselves. They make their own little school. They don't have Greek or Hebrew professors to help, you know, teach them Greek or Hebrew. They don't. They, they go and research their own words the way they want to. Okay? They do go to seminary. It's their own seminary. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Their, their own schools, their own seminary. So, um, any questions before we stop? Anyone? No? After the cameras are off? All right. So, Father, let's pray. Father, we thank you for being with us this evening. Help us to conclude this lesson next week. We pray that you will be with us to lead us and guide us. I pray for those, Lord God, who are unsure, confused. I pray, Lord God, that they would read the complete chapter of the book of Acts. Lord, give them the ability to strength the desire to want to know clearly what it is that they're being taught and what it is that you desire for them to know. I pray that you would assist them in opening up the eyes of their understanding, that they would be obedient to you, Lord God, and that they'd be able to know and see what it is that you've come to die that we would have an opportunity to know. We thank you for everything you've done and doing and going to continue to do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Okay? You can go ahead. God bless you all.